Hi, this is Ida the Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. There's been a significant transition in the last few years uh, on different ways to biopsy the prostate and moving from the transrectal to the transperineal approach. We're very fortunate to have a real pioneer in this area, Dr. Michael Gorin, who uh, did most of his training at Johns Hopkins and a fellowship there and has done over 700 of these uh, transperineal uh, precision point, transperineal access system biopsies. And Michael's going to share with us today his experience uh, and uh, with this uh, device. Thanks for taking the time to be with us, Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Crawford. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, especially alongside you as someone who has you know, really pioneered early on the concept of transperineal mapping biopsy. And so today I'll take you through uh, how we crossed the divide from the transrectal to transperineal prostate biopsy, the reasons why we did so, and how now we've arrived at the uh, more modern freehand-based approach using the precision point device. So, uh, so there are a number of complications associated with transrectal prostate biopsy. And this is a table then that's outlined in a systematic review by LIS and coworkers on behalf of the American Urological Association. At the top of the list are infectious complications. In particular, approximately about 5 to 7% of patients will have a, uh, an infectious complication from a transrectal procedure. This translates to a hospitalization rate of roughly 1 to 3%, and it's been said that up, of ha up to half of all patients who are hospitalized as a result of a transrectal prostate biopsy uh, may succumb uh, to the sepsis from, uh, from, from this procedure. So for this reason, uh, the American Neurological Association has come out with pretty clear guidelines on how we could avoid post-biopsy related uh, infections. And there are essentially three recommended methods that they've arrived at. And I'll direct your attention down here to the bottom of the flow diagram. We'll start with the, the last one on the right side of the screen, which is what's known as antibiotic augmentation. So as the world has developed increasing numbers of antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, the, the, to, to get um, <clears throat> to safely administer a transrectal prostate biopsy um, uh, in that context, the American Urological Association recommends an augmented approach where one combines an oral fluoroquinolone with an IV antibiotic, either a cephalosporin or aminoglycoside. And while this has uh, done a very, very good job at, uh, at reducing infectious complications, it does, though, continue to promote the problem of antibiotic resistance. And in time, one would expect additionally uh, resistant organisms to develop as a result of this. And so it really show, it's really associated with poor antibiotic stewardship. The next approach is one that was popularized by uh, Dr. Schaefer at Northwestern, which is known as the rectal culture or targeted prophylaxis approach. Um, these patients undergo a swab of their rectal vault prior to undergoing a biopsy. Then uh, that swab is cultured on a fluoroquinolone plate. If the bacteria are susceptible to fluoroquinolone, then you simply give them one dose prior to and one dose following the biopsy. But if the patients are um, harbor a resistant organism, uh, then the doctor is presented with an antibiotogram and they could go ahead and select an antibiotic based on the sensitivity uh, of those cultures. This approach has res resulted in a very significant reduction in septic episodes from transrectal prostate biopsy, roughly five-fold. However, because of the um, ex extended spectrum um, uh, resistant bacteria out there, um, we do still see a, a good number of sepsis episodes. Um, this study here, patients underwent the swab-based approach. However, those patients who had fluoroquinolone resistance and subsequently received the, um, the correct uh, antibiotic still had a greater than tenfold increased risk of developing sepsis. So there's something about these bacteria, even though we're giving the correct prophylaxis, that they're just hardier and more vir virulent, and still patients are coming down with infections. So the final recommendation from the American Neurological Association is to consider a transperineal approach. Now, a transperineal approach by avoiding the rectum is a far cleaner procedure. Normally, when one does a transrectal biopsy, the ultrasound probe is placed in the rectum. Alongside the probe, the transrectal needle is passed. And in doing so, it could pick 
it could pick up stool and transmit that into the uh, prostate itself, which of course is a highly vascularized uh, organ and can result in infection. With the transperineal uh, approach, the needles are passed in the area of skin between the scrotum and the uh, anterior aspect of the rectum. And the skin can be thoroughly cleansed with, uh, with either chlorhexidine or betadine. And because it's a percutaneous procedure, it's done much more cleanly. So um, there has been a number of analyses done, albeit there has never been a direct uh, sort of randomized controlled trial of uh, cohorts of patients who have undergone either transrectal and transperineal prostate biopsy. This is from a meta-analysis that was published in the World Journal of Surgical Oncology from a group in China, which found a five-fold reduction in the number of febrile episodes associated with undergoing a transperineal biopsy versus a transrectal biopsy. What I like about this analysis is that they looked at fever as the surrogate for infection. Um, it's actually somewhat difficult to capture accurately the number of infectious episodes after a prostate biopsy, because oftentimes patients complain of worsening lower urinary tract symptoms uh, it's uh, ascribed to an infection, patients given antibiotics, when they may never have had a positive culture or, or have been at risk of a serious infection at all. Here, they really limited the analysis to just those patients who had fever and so truly did have a bloodborne infection. And so we see a marked reduction with the transperineal approach. In addition to that, there's a tremendous reduction in the risk of post-biopsy bleeding associated with the transperineal approach. And that's because no longer do the needles need to transverse the rectal mucosa. I will say that in this series, there, is, there did find increased pain associated with the transperineal route. Uh, almost double the pain score is reported with transperineal versus transrectal. I believe the reason for this though is because the, uh, many of these papers employed a grid-based approach um, in which multiple needle punctures are made to the perineal skin. Now, as I'm going to get to in a few moments, more modern approaches for performing transperineal prostate biopsy use a single access cannula meaning that only a single or maybe two punctures are required to the skin, and then one simply goes in and out of that cannula multiple times. And with that, we found that the pain scores have been remar markedly, markedly reduced um, performing transperineal prostate biopsy. I will briefly say that there is one additional purported benefit of performing a transperineal prostate biopsy, and that is because of the angle of approach, one is able to uh, more adequately uh, sample anterior tumors. This is from a paper published in the European Urology, where they looked at what areas of the prostate gland uh, contain prostate cancer, and then what areas are missed with the traditional transrectal approach. What the authors found is that roughly 40% of all prostate tumors are located in the anterior half of the prostate. Oops. Now, when one employ, uh, employs a transrectal approach, up to 80% of all tumors that are missed are actually located in that anterior aspect of the gland, suggesting that the transrectal approach is, in, is simply in, inadequate for detecting many tumors which are in the anterior aspect of the gland. What we know is that these anterior tumors do display some unique biology and are actually more aggressive uh, than, than the posteriorly located tumors. So how is a transperineal prostate biopsy done? Well, historically, this has been done using a grid stepper unit. And Dr. Crawford was one of uh, the folks who really pioneered this approach uh, using the same type of stepper that one uses for brachytherapy. A uh, biplanar uh, side fire probe is placed in the rectum. A grid is then employed. And uh, through this grid, needles are passed to representative locations in the gland. This, however, must be done either under general or spinal anesthesia. The reason for that is this grid grid takes up roughly um, seven to eight centimeters in both directions, both um, uh, anterior posterior and lateral to medial over the uh, perineal skin. And as a result, one has to numb a very, very large area. Also, because there's no common access cannula, needles go through the perineal skin many, many times, making it very uncomfortable for the patient. In addition to that, the grid-based transperineal biopsy approach is associated with significant patient complications. Hematuria is seen in up to 90% of patients, along with what patients report as poor urinary flow. They also see um, some risk of infection, in particular infection to the perineal skin. When we look at uh, uh, standardized questionnaires, we know that patients have worsening of the IPSS score as well as the EEF 15 score upon undergoing this uh, multiple puncture transperineal approach. To get around this, folks have described what's known as a freehand-based technique. 
In the freehand based technique, a common access cannula is inserted into the perineal skin. And then the biopsy needle is, uh, is placed in and out of that cannula multiple times. And the needle is steered using the, uh, the urologist's hands freely um, so that they could sample representative areas of the gland. Um, this is commonly done with an angiocatheter, although there have been purpose-built devices for this, including the cam probe device, which is not yet available in the United States, but is available in the UK, which is essentially nothing more than a metal angiocatheter making this procedure possible. The trouble, though, is that this access cannula is, un is uncoupled from the ultrasound probe, meaning that one must rotate that ultrasound probe in order to find the location of the needle. Um, this is extremely challenging to do, and oftentimes the user finds themselves spending most of the procedure searching for the needle and not actually taking the biopsy cores. So to improve upon this technique, uh, my partner, Dr. Matt Alloway, invented the Precision Point Transperineal Access System manufactured by his company, Perineal Logic. And what the Precision Point is, is the common access needle, which you can see right here, which attaches to a, a rail clamp assembly, which goes onto the ultrasound probe, maintaining it in plane with the biplanar arrays of the ultrasound. And so you can see here now that access needle tethered to the probe. In tethering it to the probe now, the access needle is maintained in alignment with the ultrasound array, making it so that you no longer have to search for your biopsy needle. And rather, every time you engage that access cannula, you could see it very easily with the ultrasound probe. So we were the first to describe this technique in the in, in, uh, urology, the gold journal. And we described that there are actually two major components to this, this technique. Yes, the precision point transperineal access system, but also the concept of simultaneous biplanar ultrasound, which is made possible using any of the currently available BK ultrasound units. What we mean by that is in real time, simultaneously, we could see both an axial as well as a sagittal view of the prostate so that one could steer these biopsy needles very, very easily to different areas of the gland so that uh, the gland could be sampled in a rather systematic fashion. In our practice, we use the BK3000 ultrasound. One could also use the Flex or ProFocus series ultrasounds as well as the new Specto unit ultrasound, which uses a very, very similar probe. Um, I'll now show you some videos on how this procedure is actually performed. I'll start by showing you a short clip of how we achieve uh, adequate anesthesia for it. So in the first step of the procedure, we simply raise a wheel of lidocaine overlying the areas of skin where the access needle will be, will be inserted. Once we've raised the wheel, then with the access needle not quite engaged yet in the skin, we then take a, a, a spinal needle and pass the spinal needle under ultrasound guidance on the lateral aspect of the prostate to just beyond the levator ani muscles, where we then drop off and deposit lidocaine. This lidocaine, because it's deposited on the lateral aspect of the prostate, will start to bathe the neurovascular bundle and, and cause the prostate to become numb. As we're passing that needle into the levator ani muscle, muscle, we're giving puffs of lidocaine all throughout the soft tissue here, and importantly, along the muscle. And we do this bilaterally, and with this technique, we find that patients really tolerate this procedure well. So here are some pain scores from a study published by uh, Rick Popert in the UK, who's done many of these biopsies, perhaps even close to double than I have. And what he has shown using a vi visual analog scale is that once you administer the lidocaine, patients really tolerate this procedure with uh, pain scales in the order of about three out of 10. Um, when we administer the lidocaine, patients do have some burning associated with that, and the scores go as high as four, perhaps even five. But really, by the time that that prostate's blocked, um, the patients tolerate this quite well, uh, relieving us from the need to perform this under spinal or general anesthesia. I'll now show you what it looks like when we perform a biopsy. So we go ahead and we start by engaging that access needle into the perineal skin, and that's what I'm about to do here with my thumb. So bam, I pop the access needle into the skin. Now what we do is we take a standard 18 gauge biopsy needle, pass it through that access cannula, and then I begin steering the probe and the needle simultaneously. And I rely on that biplanar display, which you can see down here in the lower left-hand side to guide the needle to perform the biopsy. And here's a slightly larger view where I'm biopsying the right posterior aspect of the gland. Uh, I'll play that, that short aspect of it again in case you missed it. 
So there you can see the needle being guided to the trajectory, very, very clearly uh, able to see that needle with the biplanar display. So what biopsy template do we follow? Um, well, in our practice, myself and Dr. Alway, we follow the 10 sector biopsy template where we start by taking two cores of the base of the prostate, extending from the mid to the base of the prostate in the peripheral zone bilaterally. We then take from the apex to the mid, two cores in the posterior aspect of the gland, two cores in the la lateral posterior aspect of the gland, posterior lateral aspect of the gland, two cores in the anterior aspect of the gland here in the peripheral zone, and then two more in um, basically the junction of the fibromuscular stroma to the anterior transition zone of the gland, and then we repeat that on the contralateral side. So in total, it's a 20-core biopsy. Um, we look at the MRI ahead of time, and anywhere where we see a lesion, we specifically try to uh, target our cores using a cognitive-based approach uh, into those areas of concern. So that gets at what about MRI targeting? Well, here are the results of um, my personal MRI targeting experience using uh, biplanar ultrasound guidance. What I find is for PIRADS-5 lesions, I'm hitting uh, cancer north of uh, about 92% of the time. Uh, more than two thirds of those cases represent clinically significant cancer. When we get into the PIRADS-4 lesions, just north of 60% of patients will be found to have cancer and a little more than half of those will be clinically significant. For PIRADS-3 lesions, we're sitting around 35 to 40% and half of those are clinically significant. Now, if you were to look at the world's literature on systems where they uh, use you know, proper MRI fusion, most typically with the transrectal approach, you would see perfectly analogous scores here. For those though who are not comfortable performing this biopsy using a freehand, uh, using a pure freehand approach where you're cognitively guiding the needles, there, are, there is the availability of software assisted fusion systems. Uh, both the Euronav and BK Fusion units now offer freehand transperineal biopsy using the precision point device. Coelis is another manufacturer who offers their own form of the freehand transperineal prostate biopsy. Uh, all of them very similar in concept were using this needle guide um, and all of them allow for the, uh, the benefits of performing this procedure under local anesthesia, but do allow for software assistance, which in my view uh, takes a bit longer to perform than a strict uh, cognitive approach. Uh, but for those who are first starting out, I think this is a very good way. In addition, if you're interested in performing uh, focal therapy, it is nice to have the locations of every needle core mapped out so that you could then go back and plan your focal therapy. So in conclusion, transrectal prostate biopsy is a tried and true method for diagnosing prostate cancer. However, this approach is associated with significant risk of infectious complications, including sepsis. The transperineal approach reduces the risk of infection by avoiding the rectum. Additionally, it offers the benefit of improved sampling of the anterior gland. While previously this required use of a grid stepper unit, which was associated with significant patient discomfort, and so therefore had to be done in the operating room with either general or spinal anesthesia, New methods exist, notably using the Precision Point Transperineal Access System, which allows for this biopsy to be done under local anesthesia in the office setting. Early data suggests an excellent tolerability in cancer detection rates with the transperineal biopsy done in this manner. We have found it to be highly cost-effective, quick. It avoids antibiotics. In our practice, no patient gets administered antibiotics whatsoever. And we have really enjoyed very, very high cancer detection rates, and in particular, clinically significant cancer detection rates um, so that we could really offer the best care to our patients. So in final summary, I would just say transperineal prostate biopsy, just do it in your practice. The precision point device makes it all possible.